Okay, so <clears throat> this is the 150th anniversary of the periodic table of elements, which is over there. And so people realized in the 19th century that all the objects in the world, everything, are, are if you break them down into their basic atoms, there's only a relatively small number of types of atoms, only about 90 of them that exist on Earth and in the solar system. And, uh, and this, this talk is about where those different types come from. Now we know, of course, that atoms are not elemental, right? They're made of smaller bits, protons, neutrons, and electrons. So how did those come together? How did those get composited together to, to the elements? You know, that electrons, if you've taken chemistry before, electrons can come and go on atoms. Uh, an atom can take on an extra electron or lose one when forming a molecular bond. But the nuclei of atoms are much more tightly bound and how is it that those come together, the protons and neutrons come together to form elements? That's what I want to talk about. So it's about the origin of the elements. So here's the periodic table. Let me just cover a couple of uh, terms. First of all, element, the number of protons in the nucleus. So the only difference between nitrogen and oxygen is that every nitrogen atom has seven protons in its nucleus, every oxygen atom has eight, and that makes all the difference for how they interact with other atoms. So the atomic numbers are listed here down to 118. We don't have that many elements on Earth. This entire bottom row is, is radioactive. There are no stable isotopes of any of them. But I also want to talk about the word isotope. You've probably heard of the, frame, the term isotope before. An isotope of an element, like oxygen, something like two-thirds of your mass is oxygen. And of those, um, most of them are oxygen-16 atoms. Each nucleus has eight protons, like all oxygen atoms, but oxygen-16 also has eight neutrons in its nucleus. A small fraction of your oxygen atoms are oxygen-17 with eight protons and nine neutrons, and a small fraction are oxygen-18 with eight and 10. Those are isotopes of oxygen. So I'll be re uh, referring to that term. Now, one of the one of the main bodies of evidence for the origin of the elements is the relative amounts of these isotopes in the solar system. So I've got them listed by mass number, that is, number of protons plus neutrons in the nucleus. And the vertical position, the vertical size of a bar is the amount that's in the solar system. So here's, here's isotope number 56, that's iron 56, 26 protons and 30 neutrons. It's a, an abundant isotope in the solar system. The next bar is iron 57, and the next bar is iron 58. Here is, this is number 16, that's oxygen 16. Number one, the most abundant isotope is hydrogen one, and helium four is the second most. Now the abundance, the height of one of these bars is, this is a logarithmic scale. So, so this one is 10 times more abundant than this one, which is 10 times more abundant than say this one, which is 10 times more abundant than this one. So this, this represents a wide range of abundances. These least abundant isotopes, the heavier ones, are something like 100 billion times less abundant than the, the two most abundant elements, that are isotopes, hydrogen, helium. So this represents a very wide range of abundances. Um, all but about 1.4% of the solar system's mass um, is hydrogen and helium. And then most of the rest is oxygen-16. So there's really relatively few number of isotopes that are the most of, that comprise most of the stuff of the solar system. But there's a lot of pattern in here, like these bumps here, and this peak around iron-56, and the fact that every fourth isotope is higher abundant. These, any theory of where the elements were formed should be able to explain at least some of this pattern. And we'll see that, that it is pretty well explained by our present understanding. Um, oops. Uh, another source of information about where the elements come from is these so-called stardust particles. These are solid particles, very tiny. They're found mostly within um, meteorites. And they are pre-solar grains. That is, they've been solid objects since before the solar system formed. And we know that because the isotopic ratios, like the ratio of, if you take the ratio of oxygen 16 to oxygen 17 in your body, it's basically the same as the same ratio for oxygen on Pluto. 
It's a little bit different, but not much. These have ratios of those isotopes that are very different from those of from other oxygen in the solar system. And that means these things form from a different body of, of material than, than most of the atoms that are in the solar system. And, uh, and they're thought to have formed in close proximity to dying stars. Um, <clears throat> which type of meteorites are those? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I'm just wondering, they're... we're inheriting some, so... Nope. <laughs> you mean, they, might they have starred us? I, I have no idea what mm. kinds of meteorites there are. That's okay. I don't even know that much about meteorites. Now, these are very tiny. This distance right here is 0.1 microns. That's a ten thousandth of a millimeter. So this is a microscopic particle. It's not wouldn't even be visible to the naked eye. You might wonder how you can measure the amounts of isotopes in these. Well, modern mass spectrometers, this is a sophisticated mass spectrometer. And its function in life is to do that very thing, measure the different isotopes that are in a sample. And these have got these advanced in the last 20 years to be able to uh, uh, measure relative amounts of isotopes in something as small as a tenth of a micron. And in fact, one of the reasons these machines have advanced is to find out this very thing, what these, what these uh, stardust particles are made of. I won't talk too much about how the information in the stardust particles affect our understanding of the origin of the elements, but suffice it to say that they form in the, in the vicinities of these dying stars, and so they reflect the composition of those stars and constrain our understanding of how those stars make elements. Um, okay, so here's, here's sort of the bottom line of the talk. It's a periodic table color-coded with what's thought to be the, uh, the source of the primary source of every one of these elements. So, um, Big Bang fusion. So hydrogen and helium are thought to come from the very early universe, the first few minutes in the universe. And then all the rest of the elements later on. I'll talk about cosmic ray fission at the end, because that's just responsible for about three elements. But most of the top half of the periodic table, the lighter elements, are thought to come from exploding massive stars. That is, by massive they mean high mass stars, stars heavier than about eight times the mass of the sun. And um, these stars, during their lives, they, they cook up elements, they make nuclei bigger by thermonuclear fusion, and then when they reach the end of their lives, they explode, and they make even more elements, and that stuff goes everywhere in the galaxy, the, where it can be taken up in the formation of subsequent generations of stars. The, uh, the solar system is only about a third as old as the whole universe, so there were many generations of stars that existed before it, and it's not surprising that we live in a young planetary system because, of course, our physiology depends on a lot of the elements, and so we probably could not live in a planetary system that formed early on in the history of the universe because these elements had to build up. So most of the top half of the periodic table those elements come from these exploding heavy stars. Exploding white dwarfs. A white dwarf is a, an already burnt out lower mass star. The sun will leave one of these when it dies. And they're pretty stable. They're made mostly of carbon and oxygen. But under certain circumstances, a thermonuclear runaway reaction can occur in them. And then that blows up and the elements that the thermonuclear fusion forms goes everywhere. Um, so that's the top half of the periodic table. The bottom half is thought to come from two different sources, dying low mass stars. So before a low mass star, like the sun, leaves a white dwarf, it goes through a stage called the AGB stage. And during that, um, a variety of nuclear processes occur that, that, uh, that can produce the heavier elements of the bottom half of the periodic table. This has been known since the 50s. And then, uh, merging neutron stars. A neutron star is one of the possible remnants from the explosion of a heavy star. And again, these are usually stable, but if two of them merge together, it makes a cataclysmic explosion. And it's been recently been discovered that that is capable of producing these heavy elements at the bottom half of the periodic table. Okay, so I'm going to go through these one by one. So the top half of the periodic table is what these elements, the lighter ones, the bottom half is these elements, the heavier one, 
abundance. They're lower, the bottom half is lower in abundance, the top half higher in abundance. And um, uh, so that's what I'm talking about. So here's, the, let me start out with the Big Bang. Um, do you know how long it'll take for a star to explode? Um, millions of years. Oh, you, the explosion event itself is instantaneous. I mean, it takes like one second for the explosion to trigger. But to get to that point, it has to build up something in its core, and it, it takes millions of years. So the lifetimes of stars are, you know, tremendously longer than like the history of our civilization. Super long. Um, so let me talk about the Big Bang elements first, hydrogen and helium. So the modern cosmological model called the Big Bang theory, colloquially, is based on general relativity. Einstein's relativity theory, um, which uh, when he published it in 1915, some other physicists were studying it and realized that it might imply something like the Big Bang, that the space of the universe began in as infinitesimally small and expanded away and should still be expanding with all the stuff in it. The actual space of the universe was tiny to begin with and it's expanded away. So at the time, nobody really believed that because there was no evidence for it. But then in the 1920s, the expansion of the universe was discovered. And then much later, the cosmic background radiation was discovered. That has now been studied in detail, and there's very strong evidence for, for the Big Bang model that it's true. And in this model, the space of the universe in the first few minutes was very small, expanding with all the particles that, that presently exist in the universe in it. And so it was very dense and very hot. And these processes were occurring. So these look like chemical reaction equations. They're actually nuclear processes. So an electron interacts with a proton to make a neutron and a neutrino. Basically, a proton turns into a neutron, an electron turns into a neutrino. So these are the three particles that make up atoms, right? This thing never interacts with any other particles, so it's, but it's in the universe. So, so these, these are going back and forth at this very early time when the temperature was extremely high. And the protons and neutrons were roughly equal in number at that time. Then, as, as the temperature dropped, as the space of the universe began to expand, the temperature dropped, these reactions favor protons. So the, the fraction of neutrons began to drop. And um, if that had occurred for just a few hours, all the neutrons would have gone away, and we would have had protons, electrons, and neutrinos, and then eventually the temperature would have dropped enough where the electrons could join the protons to make hydrogen atoms, and we'd have a universe full of hydrogen gas and neutrinos. But that's not quite what happened, because when the temperature dropped below about 900 million Kelvin, 0.9 gigakelvin, they could start compositing together. Neutrons could join protons to form to form what's called deuterium. And ultimately, you can get helium, the formation of helium-4. A helium-4 nucleus is two protons and two neutrons bonded together by the strong nuclear force. So this, the particle physicists tell us this should have happened once the temperature dropped below 900 million Kelvin. So the neutron fraction was going down. In other words, the fraction of nucleons that was neutrons was dropping down. And then all of a sudden, this stuff started to form. And all the neutrons that were left were absorbed up into the formation of helium nuclei. Does that make sense? I know I got a lot going on here. but So here, this is some results from these kinds of computations. So the horizontal axis is temperature, 100 billion, 10 billion, 100, uh, one, 1 billion, 100 million. So this is the cooling, expanding universe. Vertical axis is neutron fraction, the fraction of neutrons plus protons that are neutrons. So it started out at 0.5 off to the left over here somewhere. And it's dropping down. Would it drop down to zero before the temperature dropped below 100 million Kelvin? And um, so the, the neutrons would have been gone by then. But here's 900 million Kelvin. So it dropped below that point, all of a sudden helium could form, and then the, the neutrons that yep. were left uh, are stable inside helium-4 nuclei. 
So according to the computation, about 11.5% of the nucleons were neutrons and uh, the rest protons. And so this, this predicts that if, if that occurred at 11.5%, then we should have 23% helium in the universe. I don't know if that makes sense. So 11.5% of the nucleons were neutrons. Another 11.5% were protons that got absorbed up into helium nuclei. And, um, and so 23% of the particles would have formed helium nuclei, the rest be hydrogen. And that's exactly what it was. There's several lines of evidence that at the beginning of the universe, the composition of, of regular matter was 23% helium and the rest hydrogen. So for example, uh, you look at the oldest stars, and they're about that fraction of helium, and they have almost none of the rest of the elements in them. So in other words, the Big Bang model correctly predicts the original chemical composition of the universe to be mostly hydrogen, but a little bit of helium. So that's mostly what formed those elements. Now I've got two other colors on the helium square, uh, dying low mass stars, exploding massive stars. So according to our understanding of this, some of the helium of the, in the solar system came from previous generations of stars. All stars are forming helium inside their core. Well, during the normal parts of their lives, all, all stars form helium, not by combining protons and neutrons, but by combining protons together. So some of this, the helium in the solar system is thought to come from previous generations of stars. And that's the beginning of the formation of the rest of the elements. So I'll, let me start talking about that there. This is called the proton-proton chain. This is what occurs inside the sun. Um, the temperature in the core of the sun is very high, right? 16 million Kelvin. And at that temperature, the particles are blasting around at very high speeds. And at any given moment, uh, a tiny fraction of the protons can, can bond together, uh, and one of them turns into a neutron. And then a few other steps may give you helium-4. Mm -hmm. This is similar to the process that occurred at the beginning of the universe, but it involves only protons and not protons and neutrons. This is how the sun shines. This is a highly exothermic process, and, um, and it's releasing tremendous energy inside the sun. The sun is producing helium at a rate of about 620 million tons a second, and it will do that for its entire 10 billion year uh, lifetime. So, and this occurs because the temperature in the core of the sun is extremely hot. So you can see helium is being formed there. At even higher temperatures, three of these helium nuclei can come together to form a carbon nucleus. The helium-4 nucleus is two protons, two neutrons. Multiply that by three, you get six protons and six neutrons. That's a carbon-12 nucleus. And this is where most of the carbon comes from. At even higher temperatures, you can get more reactions. Another helium can join a carbon to form an oxygen-16, which is the most abundant isotope of oxygen. Most of the mass of your body is oxygen-16. This is, appears to be where it comes from. So the sun's core temperature will never get any hotter than forming this stuff, and it will leave a, a remnant of carbon and oxygen gas at the end of its life. But heavier stars have higher internal temperatures, and they can do more chemical uh, nuclear reactions. This is, these are collectively called thermonuclear fusion. Fusion of nuclei together into heavier nuclei. And, um, and they're all exothermic. They produce energy for the star. And the heaviest stars can produce nuclei as, as heavy as uh, iron 56. So that at the end of the lifetime of a heavy star, it has this layered um, <coughs> structure inside its core. This is all gaseous material, of course, extremely hot, billions of degrees. And there's iron gas surrounded by progressively lighter elements. And then there's thermonuclear processes occurring at the boundaries between them. We know this because detailed computer simulations say this should happen, and these agree well with the, uh, the remnants of these stars that have already blown up. So now this activity explains a good bit of this structure here. The fact that every fourth element is enhanced in abundance is a result of these new, um, helium, what they call helium capture processes. They're being absorbed onto there, making these nuclei heavier by, by, by four units 
infer. That's that's appears to be what gives rise to this structure of this spar. And then the peak around iron. That's because it stops at iron, and then during the, the, the explosion of the star, you get a lot of uh, element production right around iron in this. This, again, is the relative abundances in the solar system. Okay, so now I said that the thermonuclear fusion stops at iron, but these colors go all the way down to zirconium. Exploding massive stars can produce those. The, the elements beyond iron um, come from can be formed during the explosion. These explosions are so energetic. But let me first talk about why it stops at iron. Uh, this graph shows the binding energy per nucleon for these isotopes. So for instance, lead 208, the nucleus of a lead atom, well, lead has several isotopes, but two, <coughs> lead 208 means there's 208 total nucleons in the nucleus of this lead atom. And and its binding energy per nucleon is about 8 MeV per nucleon. What does that mean? If I was microscopic and I wanted to pull this nucleus apart against the forces holding it together, how much energy would that take? Pull out a neutron, pull out a proton, pull out another neutron, another proton, another neutron, neutron, until they're all separate. How much energy would that take? That's 8 MeV per nucleon. Um, so here's helium-4 over here has about 7 MeV of per nucleon of binding energy. This is hydrogen-1. The nucleus is just a proton, so it's not bound to anything, so it has zero binding energy. So, okay, so a helium-4 nucleus, it requires 7 MeV per nucleon to pull that apart. That's the energy that you have to put in to this nucleus to take it apart. That means that when, it fo when that nucleus forms, when particles come together to form it, that amount of energy comes out. Does that make sense? It's the reverse process. If it takes energy, if you have to put in energy to take it apart, that's the amount of energy that will come out when it forms, which means this jump from here to here is the amount of energy that comes out of the formation of, of helium in the core of the sun. So this is the exothermic energy of that process. You can see it's a big jump. This is why the sun shines so brightly, because it has this very energetic process occurring in its core. Now, notice that carbon-12 is above helium-4. When three of these come together to form one of these, it's another jump up, which means it's also exothermic. Energy comes out. Oxygen's above this. It goes up. It's exothermic. It's exothermic all the way up to iron-56, right? Iron-56 is the most tightly bound of the uh, nuclear isotopes, and so the thermonuclear fusion stops there. It can continue on, but it'll it'll go faster in the opposite direction because it's, en it's energetically favored to end up at iron. So that's why all this iron gas builds up in the core of a heavy star before it blows up. And, um, and, and that stuff builds up and, until there's a whole bunch of it. And then for reasons having to do with relativity and, and nuclear physics, it collapses releasing a whole bunch of gravitational energy, that's what blows up the star. And we see these, these blowing up, thousands have been observed. They're blowing up all over the universe. Uh, it's called a core collapse supernova. And um, so, so the elements build up to iron in these high mass stars, and then during the explosion, even more of them can form. Uh, and that's responsible for most, well, most of the top half of the periodic table. This is a remnant of one of these exploded stars. It's called the Cassiopeia A supernova remnant. And this is an X-ray spectrum of that remnant. And you can see features due to these various elements. And they're exactly the elements expected in large abundance from the nuclear processes that are associated with these. So, uh, so that's, that's responsible for most of this part of this chart. Um, and let me talk a little bit about exploding white dwarfs, because you can see that some of these colors in here, the transition metals, are thought to come primarily from exploding white dwarfs. Okay, so a white dwarf is a burnout remnant of a star like the sun. They're pretty small, like the size of the Earth. These are some that are known in, the, in, the, in our neighborhood in the galaxy. 
but they're, they're much heavier. They're hundreds of thousands of times heavier than the Earth. Very dense. Gravity, they're all out of energy, so gravity just draws them together and makes them smaller, and they just cool off over time. They're very stable, but under certain circumstances, they can undergo a thermonuclear runaway and blow up and make a bunch of elements. And nobody's really quite sure what those circumstances are. If two of them are in a binary system, and they interact, there's several different possible ways that one of them or both of them can blow up in a thermonuclear runaway. If, if one of these is in a binary system with a dying star, it can dump mass onto it. Nobody really knows which happens. Um, you may wonder, well, if we don't know what happens, how do we know that they do this? Well, because some of these stellar explosions that are observed out there, their, their properties are highly consistent with what's expected from the explosion of one of these things. And for instance, this is the computed production of different isotopes from one of these thermonuclear runaways. There's different isotopes of various elements along here. This again has a logarithmic scale. Let me show you the same thing, a linear scale. So the only difference between this and this is the here the scale is linear. Here it's logarithmic. Every one of these notches is a factor of 10. So you can see how, how much that kind of scale exaggerates the amounts of these lower abundance isotopes. But there's just a relatively few number of isotopes thought to be produced in large quantities in these things. And here's a remnant from one of those explosions. This is called the Tycho supernova remnant. And if you look at an X-ray spectrum of this, it has features due to these same elements. Now one that you don't see is nickel 56. You don't see any nickel in this spectrum. That's because nickel-56 is a radioisotope. It's unstable. It decays into iron-56. And so there's no more nickel left in the remnant here because it's all decayed into iron-56. And in fact, that decay can be seen in the light curve of one of these explosions. It's the rate at which light is emerging from, from this expanding fireball. The fireball expands, light begins to come out from inside it, and so the the brightness increases with time, and then it starts fading off as the energy dissipates. And this part of the light curve is consistent with the decay of nickel-56 into cobalt-56. And then this part of the light curve is consistent with the decay of cobalt-56 into iron-56. So this type of supernova, they just call it a type 1A supernova. They're distinguished by features of their spectrum and features of, uh, of the how they behave. Um, these are thought to be these exploding white dwarfs. Um, okay, so between these two types of stellar explosion, that's thought to be where we get most of the top half of the periodic table. What about the bottom half? Now, I pointed out that with this energy chart, the top half, when they form by thermonuclear fusion, that's exothermic, because you're going uphill on this chart. To form the bottom half, to make them bigger, you're going back down, which means it takes an input of energy to make those nuclei. That those are endothermic processes. Um, so how are they formed? If they don't, if it doesn't occur spontaneously inside stars due to the energy production. How do they form? And it turns out they mostly form by neutron capture. If a neutron is absorbed by an iron 56, it becomes iron 57 the next heavier isotope away. And that absorbs a neutron and becomes iron-58. And this can go on. It can form iron-59 with another absorption of a neutron. And that's a radioisotope decays into cobalt-59. If that absorbs another neutron, it becomes cobalt-60, which can decay into nickel-60, which can, and so forth. So if there's, if there's a, say, a location inside a star where neutrons are available for some reason, other nuclei can absorb them and become heavier over time. It's called neutron capture. And in order to talk about that, let me, let me show you this chart. So the periodic table is every square is an element, right? Different numbers of protons. On this type of chart, they call it the Segre chart, every square is an isotope of an element. So the vertical position is the number of protons. So this whole row has eight protons, which make them oxygen isotopes. The horizontal position is the number of neutrons. And you can see here's oxygen 16 and eight neutrons 
eight protons, oxygen 17, oxygen 18. So the, the black squares are stable isotopes. Those are the ones that exist in the solar system, right? The ones that exist in your body. You have nearly all of these elements have a function in your physiology. Um, the white squares are radioisotopes, unstable isotopes, like neon or nitrogen 20. It has too many neutrons, so it decays over time into other isotopes. Uh, let me, here's a, a bigger version of this chart. So again, the black squares are stable isotopes. The colored squares are radioisotopes, and that the color of which indicates what uh, the, the primary decay mode, what it turns into. Uh, let me zoom in on this. So here, here's the iron row, 26 protons. And the blue squares decay by what's called beta minus decay. So a neutron switches into a proton. So not surprisingly, way out here where there's extra neutrons, um, an, an iron 68, one of those neutrons switches into a proton by those processes that I was talking about at the beginning. And it turns into cobalt 68, which turns into nickel 68, which turns into copper 68, which turns into zinc 68, which is stable. So these radioisotopes decay into stable isotopes over time. This um, astatine 66 decays into germanium 66, and gallium 66, zinc 66. Um, okay, so let's say you have some environment inside a star or something where neutrons are available at a, at a fairly slow rate. So an iron 56 absorbs a neutron and becomes iron 57. And then 10 years later, absorbs another neutron to become iron 58, and then 10 years later absorbs another neutron to become iron 59. That's then going to decay into there, and then 10 years later absorb another neutron to become cobalt 60, decays away, neutron, neutron, neutron. It's a 100-year isotope, so let's say it doesn't decay. It absorbs neutrons, and they, these nuclei, by slowly absorbing neutrons, can just kind of walk their way up the stable isotopes until you get to the heaviest stable isotope, which is visible. So that's in a situation where the neutrons are available at a, at a relatively low rate. What if there's another kind of environment in which neutrons are available at a high rate, like thousands per second? Then this iron nucleus can absorb a whole bunch of neutrons. And if you look at the half-lives of these radioisotopes, this is 94 milliseconds. This has a half-life of 44 and a half days. It takes 44 and a half days of it to decay into that. This has a half-life of 94 milliseconds, 0.94 seconds, um, no, 0 0.094 seconds. So it very quickly decays into one of these. Not surprisingly, the more neutron-rich a uh, nucleus is, the less stable it is to one of those neutrons switching into a proton. So in an environment in which neutrons are available at a high rate, You'd expect them to come out here and then kind of zigzag their way up the neutron-rich portion of this. So they talk about, astrophysicists talk about two different environments in which neutron capture can occur. I mean, two different processes. This is called the S process, for slow process, in an environment where a few neutrons are available at a low rate. And this is called the R process for, what do you reckon? The opposite of slow is... Rapid. rapid. This is the R process for rapid process, supposing that there's an environment where neutrons are available at a high rate. And the reason, the reason I'm saying, well, suppose there's a place where they're available at a low rate and then another place where they're available at a high rate is because back in the 1950s, they recognized that these bumps indicate that. This bump, this bump, and the left half of this bump are expected from the rapid process, the, the R process. And this bump, this bump, and the right half of this bump are expected from the S process. So the fact that there are two distinct features here indicated to people back in the 50s that there must be some place where the S process is occurring and then a different kind of environment in which the R process is occurring. And we now know, well, they knew back in the 50s, that dying low mass stars support the S process, the slow process, and just about a year and a half ago, people found out that merging neutron stars can support the R process. So the fact that there's these distinct bumps here uh, is a, a direct indication 
that there's two different locations in where, which these heavy elements are formed. Um, okay, I'll talk about why those bumps are implied um, by the R and the S process. So let me let me talk about dying low mass stars. This is this is one of these AGB stars. They blow off material through pulsations as they die, and um, and this is this is spectrum made. I copied this off of a seminal 1956 paper where they're first starting to talk about the S and the R process. And these are spectra of these AGB stars, and you can see features due to the elements expected in the S process, like barium, samarium, per perseodymium, cerium, and technetium. Technetium is grayed out on this periodic table because it has no stable isotope and it doesn't exist in the solar system. So the only way technetium, this is a spectral feature due to technetium, the only way it could exist in this star is if it was being produced there. So the observation of technetium all by itself indicates that the S process must be occurring inside these stars. It doesn't occur inside all AGB stars. You don't see features like that in the spectra of all AGB stars. But this is a place where the S process can occur. Um, here's the present understanding of the internal structure of one of these AGB stars. Here's the carbon-oxygen thing that will be left as a white dwarf at the end of its... And then there's a, a sort of a shell structure around it, and there's thermonuclear fusion occurring at the boundaries of these things. Um, and this is it's a pretty busy graphic, but this is based on computer simulations of what's occurring inside there. So the thermonuclear fusion is occurring at these boundaries between them. And horizontal axis is time, vertical axis is depth within the star. So it changes with time. It goes through these repeated pulsations. This, this chart repeats itself many times as it pulses and pulsates and chucks matter off into space. But the green regions are where convection is occurring, vertical swirling of the gaseous material in the star. And that brings the stuff up that's produced up to the surface where it's chucked off into space. These are some of the processes that produce neutrons inside one of these AGB stars. See the, the N at the end, that means a neutron is being produced. And those are the neutrons that are available to be absorbed by nuclei to be, uh, so that they can become bigger uh, nuclei from the S process. Uh, and here is. <coughs> This is, um, these points represent the relative amounts of various elements. This is element number here, right? So element 10 is what, neon, element 20 is, is it sulfur. So it's the number of protons in the nucleus. So they measured the amounts of a bunch of different elements in this star. That's the name of a star. And, um, and then the, the colored lines are computer simulation models for what's expected in the production inside these stars. And you can see that there's there's rough agreement between what's expected and what is observed in this star. I think it's a pretty remarkable agreement, considering that uh, these models are pretty complicated. I mean, there's, there's a lot of complicated structure and dynamics going on here. But there's good agreement between the production rates and the amounts that are seen in these uh, in these AGB stars. Okay, so that's, so AGB stars, that's been known since the 50s that they produce all these elements. What about the, uh, the R process? Here's a computer simulation of the R process occurring on the Segre chart. So these light elements absorb neutrons and zip up the chart on becoming heavier and heavier isotopes. And then at the end of, so once the neutrons are absorbed, those unstable isotopes decay toward the stable isotopes that we actually have in the solar system. Um, and so this is this is, comes from a computer simulation. Now you, you'll notice that they kind of they build up around certain numbers of neutrons, 28, 50, 82, 126. These are particularly stable configurations of neutrons. This is a bit like on the periodic table, there are there are particularly stable numbers of electrons, right? Neon has 10 electrons. It doesn't form molecules with other atoms. Why? Because 
because 10 electrons is a, is a very stable number of electrons, and it doesn't want to lose one or take on more because it's not energetically favored. So that's why neon doesn't form, and argon is, is below it, that argon doesn't form molecules either, neither does krypton. Uh, that's because those numbers, 10, 18, 36, those are particularly stable numbers of electrons. The same thing occurs for, for nucleons, protons and neutrons with different numbers of them because the physics is different. Uh, but they tend to pile up along here. So, and people knew this back in the 1950s. So, so you get large quantities piling up along these numbers and then they decay away. That is responsible for this bump, this bump, and this bump in this relative quantities for the solar system. So you see, it's because of these nuclear magic numbers that we get large numbers of, uh, of atoms forming with particular mass numbers. Now imagine in the slow process, it creeps up this way and they pile up here and here and there. That's responsible for, for this bump, this one, and the right half of this bump. So it's not too complicated to see why uh, those bumps should appear, and this is why they concluded back in the 50s the way you have separate little bumps in this in this abundance diagram, because both processes are occurring, one in one place, one in, the, in another place. And so they knew that dying low mass stars produce the S process elements. But for a long time, there was nobody knew what it was that was producing that was producing the uh, the R process. And when I started teaching at this institution, back when it was called the Cab College back in the nineties, um, it was thought that the most likely location where the R process occurs is these exploding heavy stars. Um, but that's fallen out of favor. Uh, the theoreticians tell us. It probably isn't supported there. But we now know, there's evidence now, that um, neutron star mergers, two neutron stars merging together can do this. And we know that because a year and a half ago, a gravitational wave was detected from one of these neutron star mergers. This is a wave through the fabric of space itself. And it was, this is another implication of general relativity. These waves have been suspected to exist for about 100 years. And they were finally successfully detected in 2015. And this one comes from a neutron star merger. The frequency is, frequency is a function of time. So the frequency of this wave um, is, this is exactly the form of the wave expected from a neutron star merger. And people had suspected that some of these stellar explosions out there that we see in the universe are two neutron stars merging together. They've suspected this for decades, but could never prove it. Um, they also suspected that these neutron star mergers were responsible for gamma ray bursts, bursts of gamma rays coming out of deep space, but they could never prove it. And they were also, in the last two decades, they were also suspected that, um, that this was a location where the R process could take place. And all three of these suspicions were validated when this was detected about a year and a half ago. So 1.7 seconds after the the gravitational wave of gamma ray burst was detected by two different gamma ray burst observatories. And because of the theoretical significance of this, they made great efforts to find the stellar explosion. So the, the gravitational wave detectors pinned it down to this little patch of the sky. This sphere is the whole sky around us in space. Yeah. Gravitational wave detectors pinned it down to that little patch of the sky. and they furiously looked in there, and it, within 11 hours found this light. This is a galaxy. This is billions of stars in a galaxy. These are negatives. Astronomers like to look at negatives because it's easier to see black on white than it is white on black. So, so here, 20 days before the, before the wave was detected, there's nothing there. Here there's a very bright light. These are stars in our own galaxy, tens of thousands of times closer. So this one is millions of times brighter than that thing. Anyway, there's a, a new light that appears there. And this was heavily studied with many, many telescopes. And here's some results. 
so the luminosity of this dropped over time, and the orange band represents the decrease in luminosity expected if the luminosity comes from the radioactive decay of a whole bunch of the R process elements being produced at the time. Uh, it doesn't match at the beginning. In this paper they say, well, that could be because as the fireball expands, at first you're not seeing deep enough into it to see where the R process elements are. And then as it expands, it gets thinner. You see more of the deep stuff. Um, sounds reasonable to me. And here's the effective temperature of the fireball. It drops down to about 2,500 Kelvin and then stops there. That's the temperature that you'd expect if these, the lanthanide elements of this row of the periodic table, if those elements dominate the light emission from that stuff. That's what's expected to be produced during the R process. These, these elements, their valence shells, have F, F shell electrons in them. And, and so if the gas was dominated by those elements, you'd expect it to emit uh, about 2,500 Kelvin uh, light emission. So these are both supporting the idea that there's loads of these R process elements. Here's something else. The, the, the spectrum of this, and this feature right here, is thought to be from cesium and tellurium. These are both elements expected to be produced in very large quantities during the R process. So this is considered, there's some other things, evidence that I didn't really understand, so I didn't include them in this. But um, these nuclear astrophysicists are pretty well convinced that, that this explosion produced large quantities of these isotopes. So this is, you know, most of the bottom half of the periodic table is produced by these, at least in these merging neutron stars. Could be in other places as well, but there is no evidence for it. Um, so, now what about these three elements, lithium, beryllium, boron? They're low in abundance, right? They exist in low abundance in the solar system. The reason your cell phone batteries are so expensive is because they're based on lithium. Lithium's a rare element in the Earth, so it's expensive. It makes great batteries, but it's expensive. They, they exist only in relatively small abundances because uh, thermonuclear fusion in stars doesn't produce them and so you don't get any production of that in stars. But we do have some, right? Because you do have a lithium battery in your cell phone, so where does that come from? That's thought to come from cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are these real high-speed particles coming out of deep space. Nobody knows why they're moving so fast. Uh, they're accelerated by some energetic phenomenon in the galaxy. But, <clears throat> but, they're atomic nuclei and electrons, and if you look at the abundance of the elements in them, here's this curve, you can barely see it there, this curve is the abundance of the elements in the solar system. So this is abundance as a function of element number. And it's matched pretty well by the abundance in these cosmic rays, except the lower abundance elements are elevated in the cosmic rays. So why would that be? Well, it's thought to be because these high-speed, fast-moving cosmic rays, as they move through the interstellar space, they smash into particles like protons and get broken apart into these light elements. And this can apparently also occur for nitrogen and oxygen. Um, so this is thought to be where those come from. So the, the lithium atoms in the lithium battery in your cell phone appear to come from this, they call this cosmic ray fission. Um, and the boron atoms that, in, that are in the borax that you use in the washing machine comes from, this is how they're formed. Um, one more thing, so here's the stable isotopes of the Segre chart. The blue isotopes can be produced in the, the S process, the slow process in AGB stars. The green squares can be produced in R process in merging neutron stars, but the red ones, these also exist in the solar system, but they can't be produced by either of those. They're very low in abundance, but they do exist here, so what produces them? Well, nobody's really sure, but one possibility is called the RP process, which, the rapid proton, proton. capture process, which um, 
nobody's been able to prove where that process occurs. It could be associated with neutron stars again, or perhaps uh, core collapse supernovae, but nobody knows where they occur. But it's conceivable that rapid pr uh, absorption of protons can produce these things. And then there's another process called the P process that can bash particles out of already existing nuclei to produce some of these. These are all low abundance uh, isotopes that exist in the solar system and nobody really knows where they come from. Okay, so here's, this is the, um, the periodic table of elements. So the top half is, our physiology depends on something like two dozen elements. And as far as I know, the only ones that we know have a function in our body that are not in the top half are iodine, which you use in your thyroid, and molybdenum, which is used somewhere. But these are the really important high abundance elements in most of chemistry. But these are also important for the, the stability of uh, habitable conditions on the surface of the Earth. And um, as of 2019, this is apparently where these things come from. Thank you for your attention. Do you have any questions? I realize it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, two, two dozen or more. Yeah, there's nobody's. There's some elements that you know are believed to have uh, some sort of function in our physiology, but um, but they're not sure. I'm not sure how they can not be sure because once you find out the structure of Protein, uh, protein or whatever. You know, if it's in there, it's in there. If it's not, it's not. But, uh, you know, like one that surprised me is boron. Boron actually has some sort of known function in our physiology. Uh, and you know, a bunch of them do. But there are other elements, you know, like uranium and thorium, these two heavy, heaviest elements. Those are thought to be responsible for the heating of the inside of the Earth, which is necessary for the habitability of the Earth. So without these, without the merging neutron stars, Earth wouldn't be what it is. We probably wouldn't be here. Um, uh, quick question. <clears throat> if you go back, um, excuse me, to um, the graph that shows the abundances, Yeah. Um, okay. Sometimes you have a graph where there there are two elements missing. Oh. Like you know, uh, five, five and nine. Yeah. Or something. Yeah, but five. Let's see. Why is it not in here? Yeah, five and eight. There are no five and eight that are stable. Thanks for coming. Oh. oh. Mm. Oh, you know what? I right. I had these arranged. Mm -hmm. Five and eight are actually not in this one. I, I produced this graph later with those in it. Mm -hmm. okay. But they, they, I don't know, the way I made this, it, it didn't appear on this one. So, so why why are they not stable? Uh, there's just no no configuration of neutrons and protons that have five or eight nucleons that are stable. Mm -hmm. um, so they decay into other yeah, they things. decay into other things. That are more favorable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any more questions? Can you go back to the one that has the different person? started out equal in number with the neutrons because at very high temperatures these are going back and forth at equal rates 
but then as the temperature dropped, then protons outnumbered neutrons. Yeah, neutrons are unstable on their own. A neutron has a half-life of like 11 minutes or something like 12 minutes. So they, it, given neutrons flying through space on their own will turn into protons over time. Protons are stable, as far as we know, so they can exist forever. Am I answering your question? Okay. So, yeah, so if this had not occurred, before the neutrons went away, then we would have just had hydrogen at the beginning of the universe. But the neutron fraction was about 11.5%, um, and, and so some helium was formed at the beginning of the universe. About 23% of the stuff turned out to be helium. And that's consistent with, this calculation is consistent with what we know about the composition at the beginning of the universe. Okay. Give the speaker another hand. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.